All right, good morning, church. Thank you for being here today. I want, they're playing choir calling music. I want to invite every person who would like to sing with us today, please come up, take a seat in the choir. Whether you're a member, a visitor, if you'd like to sing to His glory today, come up, take a seat, and let's sing it to His glory. Glad you came to worship with us. If you're visiting this morning, you're our honored guest. I hope you feel loved and welcome here because you are. Um, I hope you grab the bulletin on your way in. There are a lot of announcements. Too many to say right now, but I will highlight a couple. All right. First of all, on the inside cover, let me just say thank you for the way you give. Our Annie Armstrong offering, we shattered our goal of 3000 by almost $2,000. So we exceeded once again, thanks to you. Thank you, church. That is gonna be a blessing to a missionary somewhere in North America. Uh, we got a care meeting tomorrow night. And the last one I wanna highlight is tonight, evening service. We're not doing anything here on campus, okay? We're gonna join our sister church, Trinity Baptist, we're going to go over there, and the focus for tonight is to raise money for FCA, to send students and coaches to FCA campus. So we had that service here last year, and they brought a good crowd with them. So we want to reciprocate. We're going to go to Trinity tonight. We've got some students from Gordon Central that are going to perform. It's going to be a blessing. So if you can't make it tonight, but you still want to donate, you can write a check. Um, Make it out to Newtown and just put FCA on the memo. Okay? Thank you for how you give once again. Well, let's pray and then we'll get started. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we, we want to focus on you during this time. God, help us to turn our thoughts to you. Some of us have had a good week and some of us have not. But either way, we're in the right place at the right time, God. We ask you to move in this service today. Bless the message. Bless the singing. God, we need to hear from you. We need hope. We need joy. We need comfort. We need to be fueled up to go back out into the mission field tomorrow. God, we praise you. We adore you. We lift up the name of Jesus today in this service and every day. And we pray to you in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with us, church. Man. Daniel said that some of us have had a good week. Some of us have not. Uh, thank you for praying for my mother-in-law, Margie. She, her surgery went well. She's in a lot of pain. Remember the family of Joyce White. We had the funeral here this week. Uh, if you're a visitor, we're so thankful you've come to worship with us today. Whether you've had a good week or not, how many of you can raise your hand and say, above all, I've been blessed today. Amen. Let's sing that together, page 172, if you want to follow along in Songs of Faith, page 172.
blessing it is to be in God's house today again. Uh, Brother Tony and Cheryl, they're gone this week, but uh, he has sent a wonderful replacement that's going to preach for us today. How many of you were here the last time Brother Brian Alexander spoke? Amen. Amen. Brian and his wife Cheryl are here with us today. And uh, Brother Brian, we just want you to feel the liberty of the Lord. May He just uh, give your heart uh, that joy and that openness and that liberty to preach to us what you have for us today. Amen. So we're going to finish singing. I'm just going to point to you. You come on. Uh, as an introduction, last time he little taped a little introduction for him, but uh, he didn't do that this time. But uh, Brian is the executive director of the Southern Church Consulting Department in our Georgia Baptist Convention. So we welcome you today. Give them a hand for being here today. All right. You can be seated. Keep singing with us. Page number 284. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right.
Amen. Well, that's where he lives, isn't he? And the Bible say he uh, inhabits the praise of his people today. Amen. Whether you lift your hands or not, you know, we can all lift our hearts, can't we? And praise the Lord. Magnify him. And with all that we have and all of our being, let him know that he is the one and only highest esteemed one in our lives above all and above everything. Thank you, Lord, for today. Well, we finally got Kenny Seabolt back up on stage. After all these I was nervous. Now I'm real nervous. And uh, with the Lord's help, we're going to sing a song that he used to sing years ago here at Newtown and other places and blessed a lot of hearts with it. Those of you that know it will recognize it today. Aren't you thankful that, you know, if this was the last place on this earth that I ever came to today at church, and I went on to be with the Lord, hey, I know it. I know where I'm going. Aren't you thankful for that? If you don't know that today, you don't know that today. I pray that you'll listen to the Lord as He probes your heart and in love draws you toward Him. Respond today. Come to Him. All you got to do is say, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm a sinner. I need You. I need Your blood to cover my heart and my life. I won't come into the family of God. Would you do that today? loved one knew he'd reached the end of life's journey cause he had been holding to God's hand a long long time and as I knelt beside his bed my heart was thrilled at what he said if I go or if I stay Victory is mine I'm a winner either way If I go or if I stay Cause I'll still have my Jesus each passing day I'll have my healing here below Or life forever if I go Praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. None of us really know about tomorrow. We must prepare to go to heaven any day. So while we're here, let's trust the Lord. He'll lead us safe to our reward And by His grace we'll be a winner either way well, I'm a winner either way If I go or if I stay Cause I'll still have my Jesus each passing day I'll have my healing here below or life forever if I go oh praise the Lord I'm a winner either way well, I'm a winner either way if I go or if I stay cause I'll still have my Jesus each passing day Have my healing here below Or life forever If I go Oh, praise the Lord I'm a winner Either way Oh, praise the Lord I'm a winner Either way
Well, that's pretty good singing, amen? amen? And that's so true. We are winners either way. It doesn't matter if you got Jesus, you're, you're a winner. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the opportunity to come and be back with you dear people at Newtown. And I look forward to preaching this uh, blessed book today. I'm thankful that's the, the most fun and enjoyable thing I do is get to preach God's Word. And I'm thankful God's call on my life to do that very thing. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15. And in this text, those of you who study your Bibles, you're going to know uh, this is a very familiar passage. In the it's, Many in, uh, call this the lost chapter, where it deals with the lost sheep the lost silver, and the lost son, the prodigal son. We, we know those are, are stories that uh, God uses for a, a lesson to teach all of us something. But it's, uh, even though it's a very familiar passage, I think there's something for all of us to learn in this passage today. Very seldom do I preach this message that I don't have somebody come by and say, I never knew that. So if you're a Bible student today, many of you probably have already seen it, so God bless you. Amen. I'm glad. <laughs> but if you're not and you see something today you hadn't seen before, you're going to be saying, well, thank God I was able to see that. And then to nail some things down in your, in your heart. I want to thank Brother Tony. He, he's a dear friend of mine for the opportunity to get to come and fill this pulpit today, and I don't take that lightly. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says... Then drew near unto him all the publicans. Let's stand, sorry. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake unto this parable unto them, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which was lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, did not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And then the story of the lost son. Lord, I ask you now to take your word, and I pray that you'll be the revealer of secrets, and you'll be the revealer of all truth. And Lord, I pray that if there's one in this house today, who is lost and does not know you. Lord, that when the end of this service comes, when there's that time of commitment and the time of response, Lord, that that individual or those individuals would not say, Lord, I'm just going to wait till another day. But Lord, if there's a lost sheep in the house today, God, I pray you'd reveal it to their heart and their life. And Lord, that you'd give courage to those that are saved Lord, to be serious about the lostness of a lost soul. And Lord, I thank you for what you'll do in this service, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, one of the things that is significant about this passage, and I learned this listening to an uh, African-American pastor by the name of Kenny Grant. Uh, he taught me some things about this passage, and uh, I'm thankful for that, and I want to share some of those things with you today. If you miss the first two verses of this chapter, you're going to miss some of the interpretation of the text. The Bible says there that there drew near him publicans and sinners that wanted to hear him, and there was Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners which eateth with him. They had come to hear Jesus. They were those who were hearing great stories about Jesus, and you had people coming for different reasons. Jesus knew his audience. Jesus knew who had come to hear him. So he identifies them. First of all, he deals with them, the publicans and the sinners. Now, these were people, the lost, this is a, a picture of these different kind of folks, the, the lost sheep, these people that were 
publicans and sinners. They were the tax collectors. They were despicable. They couldn't, the people, the Jewish people couldn't stand them because they were publicans. They were tax collectors. Now, I know there's probably one thing every one of us in here have in common. There's probably not one single one of us have ever prayed all night long and woke up in the morning praying, Dear God, I'm begging you with everything I've got. Lord, I'm praying that there's any way you can send somebody from the IRS to us today to audit me. <laughs> I don't think any of us have ever prayed that prayer. And as a matter of fact, people have a, if you're here and you work for the IRS, God bless you. <laughs> but you know what? There's a, there's a distrust that goes along with that for some reason. And you know what? I think it may stem back from the days when these tax collectors, they were ones who were set forth and employed by Rome. These publicans were many times Jewish citizens, and yet they were the ones who had hired on to Rome to excise and take taxes from the people. And the one thing about it, they had to take the taxes, they had to, uh, to take those in to receive those and pass them on to Rome, but yet there was also, if they could extort or excise any other taxes out of the people, they could keep it. And so they is crooked. They had crazy rules. They had a, one time I heard that they had a, a, a West Road tax. That like if you was coming in to a, a sacrifice and you came in on the West Road, you had to pay the West Road tax. But if you didn't come in, you came in on the East Road. But if you were going to have to go home on the East Road, you had to pay that tax. So it didn't matter which way you came in. You're going to have to wind up and pay that tax. And those publicans were keeping that money. And so here you had the people who hated these publicans. The Bible says not only publicans, but sinners. These sinners were people who were living in sin. They knew they were sinners. They knew they were lost. They didn't care. And they just enjoyed living in sin. You ever known anybody like that? You know what? We all know folks like that. You say, well, that church is all right for you. You can do that. You can, that Bible's all right for you, but it's not for me. I want to live just like I want to. And I don't want anybody meddling in my business. We all know people that way. These were the, the prostitutes of the day, the cheaters, the, the you name it, the adulterers, the wicked ones. These were the ones who had come. The Bible says, but they came to hear him. Well, that's a strange thing. You've got these people who were living in open sin and they didn't care who knew it but they heard something about Jesus and they wanted to come hear him. But then you had another group of people. You had the Pharisees and the scribes. These, these were the religious muckety-mucks of the day. These were the ones who went to church and these were the ones who had their Bible and studied all of that. And they were known for being religious people. But the Bible says that the, the Pharisees, these religious folks, and the scribes, those who transcribe the scriptures... He said, these people came, but they didn't come to hear. The Bible says they came and they were murmuring. Now let me ask you something. Don't you think Jesus knew who his crowd was? When Jesus looks out and says, okay, <laughs> I got these publicans and sinners right here, the outcasts of the world. I got them sitting right there. I got a story for them. And then he said, oh, and here's these religious folks over there. They just looking for something to hang on me that I, I got their number two. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them, I'm going to relate them in the story. So here Jesus begins, they talk, we think of many times that this is a story of three parables, the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son. But really, it's one story with three illustrations. And they're meant for different people. For you see, when he gets to that story, the parable of the lost sheep, he said, what man of you, if you've got a hundred sheep and you lose one, and he goes out, won't you leave those 99 and go out and you search there till you find it? And then when you find, when he finds that shepherd, finds that sheep, he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it back. And then there's great rejoicing because that sheep that was lost that is now is found. And he said it the same way it is in heaven. When one repents, he says there's excitement and thrill over people who come to Jesus. Sheep. Let's think about them for a minute. They're dumb and defenseless animals. Many times they're directionless. 
Have you ever seen stories about sheep and saw documentaries or something about those sheep herders and all that? And you'll see a, a sheep running, the, the lead sheep, if he's running through and he jumps over a log, if they kick that log out of the way, if you've got 200 more sheep, every one of them's going to jump over nothing that may be there when they get there. They're just going to follow. The, if one jumps off, many times a lot of them get right off in the same muck in the mire that the lead sheep gets into. And many times the Bible talks about us as being, uh, illustrates human beings as being sheep. And it's really not a great thing to say about us, amen? <laughs> Dumb and directionless and defenseless. But these are the ones who've come. And you've got this, you've got this picture of this one sheep who's going to leave in this parable. This one sheep, it don't care what the other sheep are doing. It don't care if that crowd goes to church. It don't care if that crowd is moral people. They don't care. This one sheep wants to do its own thing and it just meanders away from the crowd. It doesn't care. It does its own. It's eating what it wants to eat. It drinks what it wants to drink. And it finds out. And later on, it finds out that it's lost. He looks around and where's, where's everybody at? I think that's a picture of how it's going to be one of these days when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Those lost folks will be here. They'll be doing their own thing all that while. And then they look around and all the Christians are going to be gone. And they wonder what happened. And it'll be too late. But here you've got these lost, this lost sheep. He's doing his own thing. You know what? And if it hadn't been for the loving shepherd who said, Hey, I'm going to go find that sheep. I mean, he's dumb, he's directionless, he's defenseless, he's out there on his way, on his, eating, his, eating his way out there to nowhere, and he's drinking his way to nowhere. But I'm going to go get that sheep because I love that sheep. That sheep belongs to me. And the Bible tells us that the shepherd goes and picks him up and brings him back. You know, these sheep, they're lost, and they're obviously lost. You know, years ago when I was, I was doing some substitute teaching in a high school in the hometown there where I lived, and I went in that morning and I wrote my name, Mr. Alexander. I didn't put preacher. I didn't put reverend. I didn't put anything but Mr. Alexander. And so I was, uh, started the class and I started calling the roll. When I got about halfway through the roll, I called this young girl's name and this girl said, Yo! And I look up and I said, where's yo at? <laughs> she threw up her hand. Her hair was jet black. I mean, it was jet black. She had a lot of piercings. And she had on a army flat jacket. You know, she had on one of those fatigue jackets. And she had on a pair of uh, camo pants. And she had on a pair of combat boots. And she had her pants tucked down in her combat boots and had them laced up tight. She had her feet up on a chair over there next to her. And I said, good morning, yo. And so I finished taking the roll. And when I got through calling the last person's name, I said, all right, I want you to get your books. And when I said that, this girl, I call her yo. She said, let me ask you a question. I said, yes, ma'am, what is that? She said, are you a preacher? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I, I am a preacher. She said, well, I got a couple things I want to tell you. I said, what is it? She said, I want you to know one thing. When I die, I'm going to go to hell. And when I get there, I'm going to have the biggest party there ever was because I'm going to be there with my friends and I'm going to have my boots on. Now, folks, I'll tell you something. That made me mad now. You know, I, I said, okay, okay, sis. So I had to think about it a little while, you know, because you've got to be careful what you say in public schools, even back that day. And so I said, yes, ma'am. I said, uh, you got two things right, and you got one thing wrong. She said, what's that? I said, one thing you got right, yes, ma'am, you're going to die, and yes, ma'am, you're going to go to hell. Yes, ma'am, you got that right. Well, there's several in the class went, <gasps> but I didn't back up. She didn't back up. I didn't either. I said, you got those two things right. Yeah, you're going to die, and yes, you're going to go to hell. But the one thing you got wrong, I said, you could care less what you're going to have on your feet when you get to hell. You're not going to care about your combat boots. And I said, 
take your books and listen. And I went right on. I didn't say another thing. I just let it go. She didn't open her mouth again, the rest of the class. And you know what? That day went on, went, went, went the rest of the day. And then I, on the way home, I got thinking about that. I said, you know, I'm probably going to get a call from the principal when I get home or from the superintendent of schools. I didn't know how far that, was, that might go. And you know, when I got home, I threw back in my recliner. And I was sitting there watching Andy Griffith or something. And about, about that time, the phone rang. And it dawned on me, uh-oh, that is going to be trouble. No more subbing for you, big man. <laughs> so I answered the phone, and it was a girl on the other end. And she said, Mr. Alexander? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I was in that class this morning with you. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I was wondering, was it yo? <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't. She said, uh, I was in that class. And she said, that girl you told was going to die and go to hell. She said, she's been my next door neighbor ever since we've been born. We've lived beside one another our whole life. And she said, I go to the Bethany Baptist Church down there. And she said, all of these years I have tried to get her to go to church. And she's gone to church with me a few times through the years when we had events and things like that. But she never took to it. She was too hard, hard-hearted. And she, was, she always laughed and thought the church was funny, I guess because her mom and dad felt that way. And she said, but I just wanted to call you and tell you something. I said, what was it? She said, well, when I got to the church, when I got to the parking lot of the school parking lot to leave that day, this afternoon, she said, when I got there, she said, my friend was leaning against my car. And she said, I walked out there to her and I said, what's the matter? She said, well, I want to talk to you. She said, you remember that guy telling me this morning in that classroom that I was going to die and go to hell? She said, oh, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> Everybody remembers that. She said, when I got in my truck and pulled out on the road out there, she said, I got so scared, afraid that I was going to have an automobile wreck and I'd die and go to hell. She said, I can't go no anywhere. And she said, so I just came back into the parking lot and I've been waiting on you. And she said, what I need to do, she said, you need to give your heart and life to Jesus. He is the way that you don't have to worry about hell. And there she receives Christ. And she calls me to tell me about what took place. Here this girl came in that day laughing and thought it was funny. She was lost, doing her own thing, acting like she wanted to, didn't care what anybody thought or anybody said. But when she was arrested by the great shepherd of the Lord Jesus, said, listen, I don't want you to die and go to hell. And there he took her and put her on his shoulder. The great shepherd had saved her soul and brought her into the fold of God that day. She was lost and obviously lost. But then let me just say that the lost sheep in this story represents the publicans and the sinners. When the Jesus is, when he's talking about the publicans and the sinners and the, the lost sheep, he is honing in on them who are lost. And they know they're lost. Those publicans knew they were sinners. The lost and the sinners, they knew they were living in sin. They knew they didn't have a religious life. They knew they wasn't they wouldn't close to the Lord. They didn't have a relationship with God. And so he is, he is pointing the spotlight on the publicans and the sinners. But then in the next story, when it talks about the parable of the lost coin, it said if this woman has 10 pieces of silver and she loses one, she sweeps the house and she seeks diligently till she finds it. And when she does find it, she calls her friends and the neighbors together and she said, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which, peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. And so now Jesus moves from this one parable of this one illustration of the lost sheep, then he moves to the lost silver. And he said, there's a woman. Now we don't know how much this silver was worth or this coin was worth that day, but we know one thing, it was of, of enough value that she stopped what she was doing and she diligently sought it. She quit whatever endeavor she was involved in. She stopped that and she busy to shake that out to to search the house. And then she searched it so long that if, if it took into the nighttime, she lit a candle and she searched till she found it. Let me ask you this question. Where was the coin or the silver lost? The only thing we know of about where it was lost told us in that story 
that it was lost in the house. It's lost in the house. Now let me ask you this question too. Does the silver know it's lost? Is a piece of silver laying up under the couch saying, oh Lord, please somebody find me and take me to Walmart and spin me. Have y'all ever heard of a, a silver coin or a coin calling from you out of the couch or in the carpet, under the bed? Listen, you don't know it's there unless you just happen to find it. You see, you've got here this lost silver. This lost silver represents the Pharisees and the scribes. For you see, they're lost in the house. They're lost in the house of God every week. They're in the synagogue. Listen, they're lost, and they're not obviously lost like, like the, the publicans and the sinners, because everybody else thinks they're saved. We think religious people are saved. We think they ought to be right with God. They have a relationship with God. And we pray that they are, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's true, just like it was. Because if you were to ask the publicans and the sinners, who do you think is going to go to heaven? they say, oh, it'd probably be them Pharisees and scribes. They're always doing that religious stuff. But the Lord Jesus has now got the spotlight shining on the publicans, all the Pharisees and the scribes, because they're the ones who's like the silver who are lost but oblivious to being lost. You ever known anybody who was lost and oblivious to it? They didn't have a clue they were lost. They thought they were just good as anybody else was. They thought they were just good as Jesus is. You know, there's some folks who's oblivious to it. Y'all, I remember that old story about the boy, about the boy when, a, when a thermos came out. When they first came out, this guy bought him a thermos and he went to work and he took this thermos and he put it in his little cubby hole that day. One of his buddies came by and said, what is that, man? He said, it's a thermos. He said, what does a thermos do? He said, it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. He said, wow, that's pretty cool. So he goes on home. On his way home, he stops by Woolworth or somewhere and, and buys him a thermos. And the next day he comes in. And he's got a thermos and he puts it in his cubby hole and another guy comes by and says, hey man, what's that? He said, it's a thermos. He said, what does it do? He said, it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. He said, how does it know? <laughs> Some of you catch it when you get home. And he said, man, that's cool. He said, man, where'd you get that? He told him where he got it. He said, hey man, he said, what do you got in there? He said, I got some chicken noodle soup and an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> Oblivious. Oblivious. I know that's silly, but I know one thing. It's not silly when somebody's oblivious to being lost. Because they do need a shepherd to come and help them. You got these publicans and these sinners who are lost and obviously lost. You have these Pharisees and these scribes and they're lost and oblivious to being lost. And you know, these Pharisees and scribes, you know, there was three types of people that followed Jesus everywhere he went. There was the serious ones who were serious about what Jesus was doing. Then there was the curious ones who they weren't all that serious about it. But they wanted to see a show. If they could come see a show. But then you had those who were furious you know, everywhere Jesus went, he made somebody mad. Y'all remember that day Jesus was walking through the cornfield on the Sabbath day and he just took, they didn't have anything to eat and he just took that, that corn cob and he took that corn, wrung, wrung it off there and handed it to those guys and they ate it. And man, did they get mad about that. Everything he did, he, they got furious about it. And this was part of that crowd that Pharisees and the scribe crowd. Jesus has now got the spotlight on them. They're lost in the house. You know what? There's people come to churches week in and week out all across America and across the world many times and they come and they sit on the chairs and on the pews of those churches and they're lost in the house. 
They're being religious. But they don't have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It does matter today about the truth about your own life. Where are you today? So Jesus has got these two different groups. He's got the publicans and the sinners in one group. He's got the Pharisees and the scribes in another group. He illustrates them with the lost sheep and the lost silver. Now he brings these two together to further illustrate the meaning of this story about the lostness. Then we get to the lost son. Many of you know the story of the prodigal son. There was a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son had gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to the citizen of that country and he sent him to the his fields to feed swine. And he would have fained and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I'll arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose, and he came, and his to his father, but when he saw him a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put on him and put put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found, and they begin to be merry. So here you have this convergence of these stories. You've got this lost son. This lost son, he is so full of himself. He is, he's lost, and he's obviously lost. He doesn't care what his dad thinks. As a matter of fact, he is so selfish in his ways that he went to his father and he said, Father, I'm asking for my inheritance right now. And you and I know that people don't generally receive their inheritance until their father is dead. And you know what he's basically saying? He said, I want what I want no matter what state you're in. As a matter of fact, I want what I want more than I even care whether you're alive or dead. He better thank God I wasn't his daddy. I'd have been said, too sad, so sad, your dad. <laughs> Strike a trot, son. <laughs> but here, this father, and I know this is, this is really something extra, and I'm sorry about this, but it's amazing how a lot of young folks today want to rebel against their mother and their father, and then they want their mother and father to pay for it. I'm not going to get on that, but I'm again it, amen. I, I'm, I'm again that. But here you've got this boy, and what he does, he says, man, I'm so tired of living at home. I'm so tired of daddy. I'm so tired of his rules and his righteousness. I'm tired of that. I'm not, I, I want to go and do my own thing. And so he does. His father gives him his inheritance, and he takes off, and the Bible says he winds up Spending all his money living with living riotous ways and riot, with riotous living. And he spends all that he has. And the Bible says that he joined himself with a citizen of that country. It didn't mean he just buddied up with somebody. It means that he had to go to work for a citizen of that country. And the Bible tells us that he had him down there feeding swine. Now for a Jewish boy, that was one of the most horrible jobs that he could ever think of because they knew, they were taught their whole life that swine, hogs, and pigs were unclean. You couldn't have anything to do with them. And now he is out there and he's feeding swine. In other words, he's slopping the hogs. He's feeding these nasty swine. And then the Bible said he would have fainted and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. In other words, he was so hungry he was looking in there watching those hogs eat that he, he was so hungry he thought it might be worth it to get in there and eat with them. And here's one more extra thing. Pardon me here. This ought to be, I'll rename this, this sermon called the story of extras. 
You know, it's an amazing thing what happens in the life of people here in our modern world. You know, you see mamas and daddies, grandparents and even great-grandparents now who have their adult children, their grandchildren, sometimes their great-grandchildren living with them. And a lot of times the grandparents are paying the way for all of these. You say, Brother Brian, what's that got to do with this? Let me ask you. When the prodigal son's father, if he had heard that his boy was down there at the hog pen wanting to eat, you know what? He could have said, man, I, I can't stand my boy down there. I can't stand him to be in jail. I can't stand him not having something to eat. It just tears my heart out. I can't stand it. I've got to, I've got to send something to him. And he keeps on sending stuff to them. And he creates a safety net for them and they never learn on their own. Did y'all remember what the Bible said here? The Bible said that this prodigal son would have fain had filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. What was the next phrase? And don't look. Most people say, and when he came to himself. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what's second. That's not what's first. The Bible said he would have fain had filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Sometimes, mom and daddy, you got to get out of the way and let God get a good lick on them. Do you realize that what the prodigal father did was a help and an encouragement? for that boy to come home rather than to keep him out there. But then, because his daddy didn't bail him out every time he got in a mess, the Bible said, but he remembered when he came to himself. He got thinking, even the hired servants have more to eat than I do. They got more and plenty enough to eat. So, this boy says, I'm headed home. So he makes up his mind. And he's headed home. You know, you think about this boy when he left. He had on a robe. He had on a ring. And he had shoes on his, face, on his feet. He's walk, mark, marching out of there. And he was, home, he was just so tired. And he was so sick of home. But I'll tell you what, when he came back, he didn't have a robe. He didn't have a ring. He didn't have any shoes. And he wasn't sick of home, but he was homesick. You know what? Sometimes you let God... Take care of them out there in the wilderness. Boy, he'll bring them back home. They won't be sick of home. They'll be homesick. There's some folks outside the church doors these days. And you know what? They were sick of being at home. But you know what? You let God keep them out there long enough. And you keep praying for them and keep encouraging them. One of these days they'll get sick for home and they'll want to be back home. You keep praying for them. And so here you've got this lost prodigal son. We know that the prodigal son is a picture of of the publicans and the sinners in this story. He was lost and obviously lost. But then the story moves on to the older son. The Bible says there in verse 25, Now the elder son was in the field, and he came and he drew nigh out of the house, and he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and he asked them what this meant. And he said, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and he begged him. And answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gave me a kid, a fatted calf, or anything that I might marry with my friends. But as soon as thy son has come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, and has killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was right. It was meet that we should meet, make merry, and be glad. For thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You got this older brother. He never went anywhere. He comes home this day and he's driving his big F-250. <laughs> He's driving and he comes by the house. And when he comes by the house, he hears boom, 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 boom. And he, he man, they singing. And he, he slows down, rolls the window down. They, they dancing. He hears something. They dancing. And there's a party going on there. He didn't stop. He drove on by. I wonder, did he call out and say, 
Eleazar, come up here to the barn. I wanted Eleazar to come up there and he said, Eleazar, what's going on down there at the house? Man, you're not going to believe it. Man, your brother, he is back. He is back. And you know what? Your daddy killed a fatted calf. You know, he couldn't have said anything any worse to that older son than that. That made him so mad he didn't know what to do. The Bible said he was angry. And then the Bible says something really strong. It said, and he would not come in. He would not come in. He said, all of these years I've been with you. I didn't transgress against you. I did just whatever you told me to do. You didn't ever even give me a goat for me and my friends, but as soon as this wild thing you called a son comes home, you kill for him the fatted calf. And his daddy said, son, it was the right thing. It was the right thing to do. He said, man, you, you, you've been with me all these times. Everything that I've got belongs to you. But your brother was dead. He was lost. Now he's alive. He's found. He's back home. Man, it's right that we make merry and be joyful and glad. You ought to be glad that your brother's home. But the story is, he would not go in. This older son represents the Pharisees and the scribes in this story. He never left the house. He obeyed the rules. He did what he was supposed to, but he was lost in the house. He said, Brother Brian, you may be stretching that. Well, I don't know that I am. Let me, just, let me just give you one more passage. In Matthew chapter 21, it's really a, a, the same story in a different way by Matthew. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 28, it says, What do you think? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented, and he went. And he came to the second, he said likewise, and he answered to him and said, I'll go, sir, but he did not go. Which one of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first, Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of the righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and you, when you had seen it, you repented not afterwards that you might believe. Lost in the house. Many years ago, I was a, I'm a, I'm a, I've always been a big hunter. I'm big and I like to hunt, but I like to hunt a lot. And one afternoon I was bow hunting and I had my bow and arrow and I had a a deer came in and I shot and I didn't make a great shot and the animal run off and I saw blood trail. So I went home and I got my dog. I had a golden retriever by the name of Chili. He's a chili dog. <laughs> and, uh, and so I went home and I got one of my buddies and I got Chili dog and I put, him on the, I put him on the back of the truck and we ate supper first and then we went out there. And so we looked and looked and looked and the dog got on the blood trail. He followed that thing for a hundred 200 yards until the blood trail dried up and the dog didn't know where to go. And so it got late. It was 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Then we was, and so me and Rick and I, we, I told Rick, I said, Rick, which way the truck? He said, man, it'd be that way. I said, man, there ain't no way it's that way. It's that way as, if it's anywhere. He said, well, let's go. So I led the way. 45 minutes later, we wind up in that same clearing right there. He said, uh-huh. I said, a truck was that way, huh? I said, well, I thought it was. I said, Rick, which is it? He said, man, it's this way. I know which way it is. I said, well, let's go. We mark an hour and five minutes later, we come back into the same clearing. And we're sitting there. And I'm frustrated. We got to get up and go to work the next morning. And I was sitting down there on a log. And I was sitting there. And old chili dog, he was over there. He's tired. He laid down. And I said, what are we going to do? And old chili gets up. And he walks over there and gets right in my face. Now, I'm not in any dog licking in the face mood, amen. 
And I said, Chili, you better go sit down. He just turned, went over, and he laid back down. We sat there, and I said, Rick, what are we going to do, man? And we was frustrated. And finally, I said, Brother, we got to do something. He said, I don't have a clue which way to go. I said, I don't either. I said, Lord God, who knows where to go? Oh, Chili gets up. He walks over and sticks his face in my face like he's going to lick me. I, I said, uh-uh, uh-uh. And it dawned on me. I looked at Chili, and I said, Chili, load up. Man, he took off that way as hard as he could go. 23 minutes later, we get to the truck. Chili's on the back of the truck, just shaking his head, wagging his tail. He's just thrilled as he could be. Man, I petted that dog, hugged him. I let him lick me one time. <laughs> And I closed that tailgate, man, I went home. I got, it was probably one o'clock or so. And I remember laying in that bed and I thought, man, what a rough night. And I got thinking about that dog and I began to think and God began to speak a spiritual lesson to me. He said, Brian, the whole time you was lost, you had the answer to your lostness right there with you. Folks, you walked in this door today and you may be lost in the house, but you've heard the gospel enough. If you'll put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved and saved today. You say, Brother Brian, would you, why would you preach a message like this? I preached this message in Macedonia Baptist Church up in Hiawassee, Georgia, a few years back, and an 83-year-old lady walked down the aisle and said, I've been in church all my life, but I've never made a decision for Christ. I've, I don't have a personal relationship with him. I've been a great church member. I was in Greshamfield, Georgia two years ago and I preached this message and the lady who sang the special music that night walked down the aisle, took the pastor by the hand. She said, when I was eight years old, I walked down the aisle because my mama said, don't you think it's time you join the church? And she said, I walked down the aisle. The pastor said, why are you coming? He said, I, she said, I want to join the church. He said, okay, well, I'll baptize you. And she said, he baptized me. And she said, I've been in the church all my life and I have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ and asked him to save my soul. And she gave her heart and life to Christ. We had a youth worker at a church one morning came and said, preacher, I'm the one who's lost in the house today. And you know what happened when all of those got saved? Man, it fired that church up. They got so excited. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus and everybody in here thinks you do, but you know the truth, listen, don't worry. They will be thrilled out of their mind. We had a pastor over in, in Carrollton, Georgia, about four or five weeks ago, pastoring a Baptist church, said he'd been preaching in the energy of the flesh his whole adult life. And he said, I'm going to get right and real with God tonight. And he did. Folks, this message is not to put any undue pressure on anybody who knows they're saved. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, today is the day of salvation. And this church will be thrilled out of their mind if you get that right today. Is that right, church? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. This is the time of decision. This is the time of response. If you're here today and that's you, that you're lost in the house, and you know that, and you may be ashamed of that, but don't you worry about that. Today is the day of salvation. You know what? There's a crowd in heaven wanting to rejoice over one sinner that repents and comes to Jesus today. This invitation is a time to respond to the Lord. You say, Brother Brian, I wouldn't even know what to say. I'll be standing down front. And you can just come and say, Brother Brian, I'm lost in the house. And let me just share with you how to be saved and how you, what to take, what next step to take. But if you've never been saved, deep down in your heart, you know it right there where you sit in the privacy of your own heart. Why don't you just, if God's knocking on your heart's door and you know that and you realize that, why don't you just pray to him? Not out loud, but pray to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sitting in this church house today and I'm lost. You know that and I know that. But Lord, I feel your conviction and I feel you calling me home. Lord, I want to be saved. I ask you, forgive me my sins. And I mean that. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. Make me clean. 
And Lord, I pray you'd save my soul, and I trust you to do that. Lord, I'm going to ask you to teach me how to live. And Lord, I do want to have this close, loving relationship with you. Lord, you put the spotlight on my heart today, and I want to be right with you. If you're here and you pray that prayer, when we stand and sing, I'm going to ask you to just step out and come down and just say, Brother Brian, I pray that prayer to receive Christ today, and I meant it. And we'll share with you what your next steps should be. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, for those who are under conviction about making the right decision for you today, Lord, I pray that the devil will not bully them from doing what's right and making it known. Lord, that they not be ashamed of you, but Lord, they would be thrilled that you saved them. If they prayed by faith, believing with all their heart, you would say that you promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God, I'm trusting you to give them the courage and boldness to do what you'd have them do. Lord, if there's a parent here today or a friend that's broken over a lost loved one, God, I pray that you'd burden their heart, that they'd be serious about praying for them. Lord, they'd be like that prodigal father praying that that boy would come home and make his life right with the Father. So God, I pray that you'd move in our hearts. Lord, we, we no longer take it serious about lost folks. Lord, the truth is that lost people who die without Christ die and go to a place called hell that was never intended for them. So God, I pray you'd have your will in this time of invitation. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Brother Jeff. I must tell Jesus yes, all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone in my distress. God stay with your heart. You just step out and come on. Listen, to me, the most liberating thing you've ever done is to make it right with Him. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I must tell your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. The service is almost over. If God's dealt with your heart today about your own personal salvation, you say, God's dealing with me and I'm, I'm dealing with Him. But you just remember me when you pray. There's nobody looking for me. You want every eye closed. You say, Preacher, would you just remember me? Just slip up your hand and right back down. Anybody, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Somebody else, bless your heart. Oh, Jesus loves you. He loves all of us. And God wants us in the right relationship with Him today. There's only two classes of people, lost and saved. If you're saved, amen. Praise the Lord. But if you're not, God's knocking on your heart's door today. Make that right with Him before this day is over. I'm going to ask Him to sing one other verse. God's dealing with you about your own life or somebody else's that you need to be praying for. Listen, this invitation is wide open as we sing. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask Him, He will deliver.
you for your coming today. You've been a gracious audience. And listen, don't take for granted your salvation. God's left us here because this lost world needs Jesus. And that's the reason for the existence of this church is to fulfill the Great Commission. So be busy about telling people about Jesus, the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son. Thank you for your kindness today, Brother Jeb. Brother Brian, Cheryl, for being here. May God bless you. Thank you for pouring your heart out, what God's given you today. If we never meet again, we'll see you on the other side. And uh, remember the joint service tonight, Trinity, care tomorrow night. If you'd like to come out and help us pray and send some cards out in the community, then we'll meet at 6 o'clock with a light supper. Until we see, meet again, we'll disconnect for now. You're, lib you're free to go.